Welcome to Module 3 in Windows Server 2019. In this module, we're going to talk about DHCP, Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol. I remember the first DHCP server I set up. Basically, what it does is it, it allows a server to hand out an IP address to a client or any other server that has it set to automatic IP. And this will make a lot more sense as we go through this, this module. I installed a small network. I uh, used a little switch and I had a client and I had a server and I installed DHCP on the server. And I went to the client and I ran the IP config command and I refreshed it and sure enough, it got an IP address from the server. And I was very excited. It was the first time I'd ever seen that. So this is what we're gonna be talking about in this module, but not just how to set it up, but also how to set up redundancy and failover. So as I mentioned before, DHCP is to automatically configure network devices with an IP address. In order to communicate in Active Directory, an Active Directory domain, or even on the internet, we need to have an IP address. And that could be either IP version 4 or IP version 6, it doesn't matter. And you can, uh, do, you can assign those using the Windows Server 2019 DHCP uh, server role. I remember my first assignment as an IT administrator a long time ago. Basically, my job was to go around to all the different computers when we were first getting started into TCP IP. And this is when people were in dial-ups. They didn't really have high-speed internet, so they didn't feel the need to have TCP IP installed. But the company I worked for, they decided, you know what, we need to implement TCP IP because this is coming. This is what we're going to be using going forward. We're not going to be using the old NetBuoy protocol or IPX, SPX anymore. We need to use TCP IP or IP addressing. And so uh, they said to uh, the two of us that were in charge of, of all of these computers, go around and set up an IP address on every computer. And we did that. And uh, when a change needed to be made, such as we needed to change a DNS server or a gateway or whatever it was, we had to go to every single computer to do it. And there was like 100 computers. And uh, we quickly realized that this was not an efficient way of assigning IP addressing. We needed to learn how to set up DHCP. And so there, of course, were no classes back then to learn DHCP. So we had to buy a book and figure it out. And that's exactly what we did. Fortunately, you have a class where I'm going to teach you all about how to set up DHCP and all the different features that come with it. So let's assume that your client by default is set up to receive IP addressing automatically. A static IP address is when you go in and you manually set the IP address. So you would have to you know, override the automatic settings to do that. So when that, that client computer, say, reaches out to say, hey, who's got the DHCP server role so I can get this IP address? So what it does is it sends out a packet. A packet of data is basically just like an encapsulated piece of information that goes from your computer out to the rest of the network. And it broadcasts this information. It says, hey, who is the, who's running the DHCP service? And so it goes out and, and all the other computers say, not me, not me, not me, until finally a server says, yep, that's me, I've got it. And so it's that it takes that discover packet and then it, it, it makes you an offer. It gives you a DHCP offer. Then once you uh, it gets back to you, you make the DHCP request for that IP address. Then the server will acknowledge your request and your IP address has been handed out. All this happens within a very short amount of time. And the only way it's ever going to get blocked is if, for some reason, uh, somebody sets up a DHCP server and that server somehow blocks the ports that are used for DHCP. And that's typically not going to happen. It's not going to happen by default. It would have to happen on purpose, which, of course, you would not want uh, to have on your network. So you install the DHCP server role through Server Manager, just like you would any other server role or feature. And you install it on, uh, you can install it on domain controller, but you can install it on any Windows server. It doesn't have to be a domain controller. Cannot be installed on a client, however. And you would assign various different uh, options within the, the DHCP server, such as the gateway, the DNS servers, and things like that, which will make a lot more sense here. So besides installing this through Server Manager, you can also install DHCP Manager using Windows Admin Center by connecting to the server that you want to have the DHCP role. And you can do it through PowerShell, of course, 
There's also a way to do it through command line as well. So if you're doing it through PowerShell, you would put in add dash windows feature DHCP. Now this is an interesting conflict. Uh, so you see here, it's adding the windows feature, but I said this was a server role. Server roles and server features are two different things. However, when the person who invented PowerShell, uh, the PowerShell commandlet to install DHCP came along, they didn't separate roles and features. They just call everything features. So no matter what server role or feature you're installing, it's always going to start with add-windows feature. So that's a little bit of a sidebar from DHCP, but it's something that you'll need to know in the future. When you install DHCP, the, the management tools are also installed by default, and that allows you to go in and uh, set up what's called a DHCP scope. And inside the scope is going to be a pool of IP addresses, which is just a range of IP addresses that you allow the servers to assign to users or, or to the computers that the users are logged into. One of the DHCP options that you're going to need to make sure is in there is the DNS server. Because once again, Active Directory and the internet don't work without DNS, domain name system. So you're going to need to tell DHCP where your DNS server is. Now all domain controllers by default are also DNS servers. So you would just assign one or more of your domain controllers IP addresses running DNS uh, to let your uh, DHCP server know to hand this information out to clients. So if they get the DNS server that will allow, you to, that'll allow them to resolve names to IP addresses, it will allow them to uh, also use the gateway to get out to the internet or other uh, subnets within the organization. And there's dozens of different DHCP options. The two most important ones are going to be your DNS server and your gateway. Uh, there are other ones which are also important, but without those two, along with the IP address, you're not getting anywhere. You can apply these DHCP options at several different levels. You can do them at the server level, which basically means that uh, you can assign them once to the server level and then all the scopes will get them as well. Or you can override the server level at a scope level and say, okay, I want this particular scope to get a different DNS than everybody else. Then the other option is gonna be the class level and the reserved client level. I don't know of anybody who uses those, so I'm not gonna spend time on it. But uh, just be aware that there are other options as well. DHCP is going to use what's called a scope. Within the scope is the range of IP addresses called the pool, along with all of your options. Now the options are the ones I just talked about, DNS and the gateway and things like that. So that scope is also going to include things like reservations and exclusions, which we'll also talk about. But let's take a look at the scope, for instance. So inside the scope is your pool, which is your range of IP addresses. So if you're on a 192.168.1.0. network, which is a slash 24, which means that the usable IP addresses are one through 254, then you can say, hey, uh, you can get any IP address address from 1 through 254 if you want. So the first device will get 1, the second device will get 2, etc. But what if you have static IP addresses on your network? Well, we're going to deal with that in a minute. So we also have this option called a reservation. And I typically would use reservations on network printers or other devices that always need to have the same IP address. Once again, if you assign static IP addresses to things like printers and you need to make a change such as the DNS server, then you got to go to every single DNS, every single printer to change that DNS manually. You don't want to do that. So what you do is you create a reservation. So you say that printer, printer number one on the first floor is always going to get 192.168.1.10. And so you can reserve that IP address for that printer using what's called their MAC address, Media Access Control Address. That's the physical address that's burned into every network interface card. It is a physical address that is in hexadecimal. So it's going to be using letters A through F and numbers 0 through 9. And you can get the MAC address simply by pinging the IP address of a device, and then you, it'll actually show up in the ping what their, uh, what their media access control address is when you type ARP space minus A. And there's other ways to do it too. You can do a printout from the printer. It'll tell you its MAC address. You can uh, look at various different pieces of information about the printer. It might show it there as well.
And every device is going to have something like that that broadcasts its MAC address. So you take the MAC address and then you give it a reserved IP address to match. And then it will, every time that device reboots, it will always get the same IP address. So you can always find that printer. Every DHCP server needs to be authorized. Now, the first DHCP server you add in that's on a domain controller, if it is on a domain controller, is going to automatically be authorized to hand out IP addresses. If you assign DHCP to a non-domain controller, then you just have to right-click on that DHCP server and DHCP manager and choose Authorize, logged in as the administrator of the domain. And then it will go ahead and allow it to do that. So the reason for that is because if a non-authorized server gets on the network to start handing out IP addresses, then that authorized DHCP server will turn its services off. So that way uh, you know that there's some sort of a rogue DHCP server on there. Now I've been involved in many different rogue DHCP servers and they've never been malicious. They've always been an accident. So for instance, I had a company that made little devices, little network devices that had built-in DHCP servers. And every once in a while, an engineer would accidentally plug that into the network and then it would shut off the uh, DHCP authorized server. And then nobody could get access to any services because it was always a different subnet than the one we were working on. So I'd get a call saying, hey, nobody can get on the network. And then I would ask them to you know, check their IP address. And I go, oh, you've got a rogue DHCP server. That's not even the right subnet. I would drive over, we'd find it, we'd turn it off or unplug it, and then uh, we would uh, turn back on the DHCP services, and the authorized server would then again kick on. You must authorize DHCP server roles in Active Directory before it can give that address. And like I said, it's as simple as just right-clicking on it and uh, telling it it's authorized, logged in as a domain administrator. Pretty simple, but it has to be done, otherwise it won't work. Now, if, again, if it's on a domain controller, it's going to work automatically. A standalone DHCP server is one that's running Windows Server, not a member of Active Directory Domain Services, and has the DHCP server role installed. I don't recommend this at all unless you don't have Active Directory anywhere on your network. If you have Active Directory in your network, use a server that's a member of the Active Directory domain. It's been joined to the domain. Uh, that's the one you want as a DHCP server. Um, otherwise, you won't get the same options that you would get uh, with a domain if you're already using Active Directory domain. Now, you can add some redundancy and some high availability for DHCP. One of those ways is what's called DHCP clustering, and that's where you have more than one server, which we refer to then as a node, uh, that's part of a cluster, and it uses shared storage. So that clustering will uh, work when one server node goes offline, the other server node uses that shared storage, such as from a storage area network device, a box of hard drives. Uh, and it becomes the new DHCP server automatically. Um, so that's one way of doing it. You can also use what's called split scopes, DHCP failover, and then we're going to talk about configuring that failover. All of this is going to be discussed within your book that you'll be using for this course. So go through all those different ways of uh, managing DHCP and you will definitely understand that a lot better. Now, DHCP uses TCP port 647 so for failover. So if you ever can't failover properly, it could be that that port is being blocked. So you need to make sure that that's good to go. And you can see these other ports here as well. There are ports for TCP in, TCP out, managing DNS services, and other things. So let's talk about DNS. Domain name system is uh, something that makes... Active Directory work. It resolves names to IP addresses, as I mentioned before. And it does that using what's called zones. So for instance, Microsoft.com could be a zone. Contoso.com is a zone. WidgetLLC.internal, that's a zone. And inside those zones are records. So let's talk about that. Uh, the introduction here, we've got the most common use of DNS is resolving names such as DC1, to IP addresses, such as 192.168.0.10, for instance. And that's all because it's easier for you to remember a name than it is to be to remember an IP address that that IP address might change on a regular basis. And so, for instance, if you go to google.com uh, you know, today and you go to google.com tomorrow, it may be a different IP address because a different server may be re responding faster uh, than the server you used the day before. And DNS is what will direct you to the fastest server.
DNS comes in what's called a namespace. As I mentioned before, widget LLC dot internal could be a zone, but it's also part of a namespace. So a fully qualified domain name would be dco1.widgetllc.internal because it includes the zone name, widgetllc.internal, and the host name of your server called dco1. Put it all together, that's a fully qualified domain name. So DNS works both privately uh, in your Active Directory domain and also publicly. So if you're going to a website such as google.com, as I mentioned before, then uh, you're using the public DNS for that. And who assigns all those things? Well, that's the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, or ICANN. It used to be managed by the U.S. government, Department of Defense, but we gave that up once the Internet became an international uh, type of thing and we wanted to better humanity for it. DNS servers can be both public and private. It could be on your domain controller, it could be on a standalone server, and it could be, of course, out on the internet as well. So you need to have a public DNS server even at home to get out to the internet to get to various different websites or applications on your phone. So Windows client can send a DNS request to resolve uh, a DC1 computer and then it comes back with the proper IP address and takes you to that site. A resolver is a client, such as a Windows client. So a uh, DNS resolver is going to be the one that requires the resolution of a name to an IP address. And uh, once it makes that request and it gets it, it's now been resolved. DNS zones. Uh, DNS servers responsible for resolving requests for namespaces. You can create a zone on a DNS server that corresponds to the namespace. So if a DNS server is responsible for Contoso.com, as you see here, you would create that zone inside the DNS server. And you can create a lot of different zones. So for instance, you could have a dco1.widgetllc.internal, and you could have a dco1.contoso.com. They both have the same host name, dco1, but they have completely different zone names, or uh, the, the end part of the name, which would be the contoso.com portion known as a namespace. And therefore, those are two different servers because one's in one zone and one's in another. Now, when you create a zone and you get an Active Directory zone automatically when you create uh, an Active Directory domain at Forest, uh, you have a couple of different records there by default. The start of authority record is there, and it basically tells the entire world that's connecting to the server that this is the writable copy of this zone. If it doesn't have the SOA record that's pointing to that server, then that bas basically means it has a read-only copy. And the read-only copy is good for replication to remote offices, for instance. Then you have the name server record. The name server record tells the world where the DNS server is. Name server is just, it's just, you know, NS for domain name system. So uh, you've got the name server pointing to where the DNS server is. So if you ever want to do a name server lookup, uh, you can do what's called the NS lookup command from a command prompt. You can go ahead and try that right now. Type NS lookup, type in your favorite website, and it tells you the name server that's responsible for managing that particular record. Resource records in forward lookup zone. So a forward lookup zone resolves names to IP addresses. And a reverse lookup zone, guess what, resolves IP addresses to names. And the reason you may need that information is to do things like looking up uh, you know, name servers, doing the NS lookup command, uh, but also various different applications need to have a reverse lookup sometimes. So there's lots of different reasons for a forward lookup and a reverse lookup. So if you're creating a host record, so for instance, for DC01, um, then if you're using IP version 4, like the 192.168, that's IP version 4, then that's where you create an A record. Now, if you're going to create an IPv6 version of that, you see there's four A's. We refer to that as a quad A record. So an IPv6 is going to be in hexadecimal, that 0 through 9 and A through F. Now, why is it 0 through 9 and A through F? Well, you, when you go 0 through 9, those are all numbers, right? But they're single-digit numbers. Well, that ends at 9. When you go to 10, now you have double-digit numbers, and that can confuse uh, a, uh, an IP address, because you don't know if that's a 1 and a 0 separate, or if that's a 10. So what they did was they said, well, let's create hexadecimal. Hexadecimal allows us to take the letter A, and it represents 10. Then you take the letter B, it represents 11, and so on and so on, until you get to the letter F, which represents 15. 0 through 15 
is 16 digits. And therefore, that's hex for 16, hexadecimal. Now you know. Then you have the alias type of record, which is a C name or canonical name. So uh, basically, if you say, you know, maybe you go through a merger, you've got uh, company A and company B. Well, if company A buys company B and company B is B.com and company A is A.com, you want anybody who goes to B.com to be redirected to the name A.com. So that way they know that, you know, A has purchased B. So that's what an alias or C name is. It'll make a lot more sense when you start creating those types of records. Then you've got the service location record. That, that's the, uh, uh, where the service is located for name servers. A little bit like a name server record, except for it's the domain name service. Then you've got mail exchanger MX that says where to send uh, email to. And then you've got text records, which are used for lots of different purposes. Lately, they're being used to help block spam by creating an SPF or sender policy framework uh, record using text records. And that is a more advanced type of thing we can talk about in 288. So resource records in reverse lookups, the most common type of record in a reverse lookup, remember that's IP address to name rather than named IP address, is called a pointer record or PTR. So instead of creating a host record, an A record, I'm creating a PTR record, which does the same thing, but in reverse. So in this case, I want to resolve the IP address of 172.16.35.100. So if I see an IP address on my network and I'm like, what, what computer is that tied to? Uh, I can run a command called ping minus A, and ping minus A resolves an IP to a name. And it'll tell me, oh, that's just fileserver.contoso.com. Okay, great. Now I've used my reverse lookup to find out what resolves an IP to a name. Then we've got time to live. That's how long a record can live before a change can be made. And that keeps hackers from going in and making changes uh, to records as soon as you make a change to them. So it's, there's a 60 minute wait time uh, for a record that it can be changed by default. You can get this down to, to zero seconds if you want, but not all uh, public DNS servers will support that. Now, uh, private Active Directory domain name services, they, they actually can uh, change the records immediately, uh, but public DNS servers don't do that. Uh, they'll typically go to as little as 15 minutes, and it also keeps replication traffic down by not having them uh, be made available instantly. Aging and scavenging is important because uh, what it does is it keeps records from getting stale. So, for instance, if I statically set google.com to a certain IP address today and tomorrow it changes, now I've got a stale record. Well, stale records can also happen internally as well. So, uh, you could have a name to an IP address uh, for a certain amount of days, and then what, it, what the DNS server will do is it'll go out there and it'll say, hey, is this name still to this IP address still valid or did it get changed? And so uh, aging and scavenging goes out and makes sure that all records are still up to date. You can manually create an A record or any other type of record that you'd like, or you can just let uh, automatic or dynamic creation happen. So when a computer joins a domain, a, a DNS record, it gets an A record automatically gets created in the zone in Active Directory. So if your computer is called Client01, you join the domain, next thing you know, you go into DNS, DNS Manager, and you're gonna see a record for Client01 pointing to whatever its IP address is. And if that IP address changes, then it will dynamically change as well. Static records will not change, however. The DNS zone has what's called secure dynamic updates. So you can restrict the zone to only allow secure dynamic updates, which uh, will allow you to make sure that no dynamic updates happen from, say, non-Windows devices in an unsecure manner. DNS forwarding is going to forward a request off to somebody else. So if it doesn't have that record locally, it says, hey, you can get that record from this location over here. So you can have a default forward off to, say, a public DNS server. So a client says, hey, where's Google.com? It goes to your Active Directory DNS server, says, I don't have that. It forwards it off to the Google DNS server, and then it comes back and gets handed off to your client. That's the generic uh, all default type of forwarding. You can also forward by specific uh, zone. That's called a conditional forwarder. So you can say, um, I want any requests that go to contoso.com to go to this DNS server. I don't have the records here, but you can find them over there.
So you can configure DNS zones by just right-clicking and adding more zones. Then you can go in and add or delete specific records within DNS, or just allow dynamic updates to do it for you if that's good for you. DNS is automatically integrated into Active Directory, and like I said, it cannot function without DNS. DNS policies are something that you can add into DNS servers. So you may create a policy to respond to queries asking for the IP address of a web server to respond to a different IP address based on the closest data center of that client. So that's one example of a policy. You can even lock it down so you won't accept any DNS uh, requests from certain types of devices. So there's lots of different policies that you can apply. DNS security is a fairly new thing. It came out with Windows Server 2016, and it allows the encryption of communication between clients and DNS servers. So basically, if you receive a request from a trusted, uh, encrypted, uh, secure DNS server that's been configured this way and then uh, pushed out through policy to the client, then that client knows it can trust that DNS server response. If it, if it doesn't get a response from a trusted DNS server, it won't accept it. This requires additional setup, but it definitely adds additional security to your network. And you do that by signing the DNS zone. It creates a certificate, a key signing key, and that uh, you know, signs all of the communications that happen between the client and the server. In this module, we learned all about DHCP and DNS, but we've really just scratched the surface. Your lab will get into this even more that will help you understand it even better. And as you read your book, you'll also get a lot more details. And that will do it for module three.